Brian Gluntz joins me now in Charlotte. He is a pollster and former Republican strategist. He has conducted more than 2,000 surveys and focus groups over the past decade. I am pleased to have him back on this program. Welcome. Thank you. And I am tired. That's a lot of focus groups and surveys. <laughs> I want to talk about the focus groups in which you're seeing, but just give me your overall sense of where we are at the, at the con through the Republican convention, halfway through the Democratic convention. We're dead even. Uh, the closest states, Barack Obama seems to have a one or two point lead, but it's all within the margin of error. Nationwide, it is actually a 46-46 race. Barack Obama has proven in this campaign that he does understand people. But he hasn't proven that he can solve their problems. Mitt Romney has done a good job demonstrating that he's a problem solver, but he hasn't been successful in demonstrating he gets those problems. And that's why we're split 50-50. And is there an idea as to whose future they most want to invest in? We asked that question, actually, in the last two dial sessions I've done, and the answer is that they really wanted Barack Obama to succeed. They really believed in that hope and change. And it's because a, of the whole picture, the, the narrative of Barack Obama. All of it. His Young, intelligent, uh, post-partisan. communication school, right. skills. The problem is, mm -hmm. Charlie, if you came to my sessions, it would break your heart. People talk, it's no longer anxiety. It's almost depression. It's despair. And they've stopped being angry, and now they're just trying to survive. And so they look at these two individuals, and they don't trust either of them. They don't trust Congress. By the way, as bad as Barack Obama might feel, Congress is hated even more. They've got a, Hasn't that always been so? Not a 10% job approval rating. Yeah. Gaddafi had a 14% job approval rating, and that was among people who killed him. Yeah. It, it, we have come to believe that politics doesn't work. We've come to believe that our systems are broken. And as I look at the communication, there's nothing that says, I made a mistake, I got it wrong, I apologize, now let me get it right. I read something today, this was a USA Today interview with President Obama, and basically he talked about the fact that he thinks the country is not caught up in the ideological divide. They're caught up in the idea of why things don't work, which is dysfunction in Washington. There are partisan feelings about Democrats or Republicans, but it's not an ideological thing. Is that true or not true in your judgment? Well, in the statistics, by two to one, more Americans do identify themselves as conservative. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying, okay, go ahead. But I'm saying ideological in terms of, of sort of the, the, the extremes of either party. No, they don't want that. And the truth is, this election is not going to be decided by the extremes. It's going to be decided by the mainstream, by the people dead center, who believe in a right of center economic approach and a leave us alone on social issues. So they're closer to Barack Obama on social issues, closer to Mitt Romney on economic issues, and so they're torn. And the problem is they claim, and by the way, there's a difference between independent and unaffiliated. Independents are those who reject Republican and Democrat and choose from both. Unaffiliated have actually said, I don't care, I'll follow this on election day and that's it. The problem is that neither candidate is speaking to them in the way they want to be spoken to or talking to them mm. the, the words that they want to hear. All right, let me take a look. Tell me about focus groups. First of all, just define what a focus group is and how you create them. And I do it differently. My focus groups have 25 or 30 people. We do it for three hours at a time. We give them these devices the size of a remote control, and they turn it up or down based on whether they agree or disagree, yeah. are persuaded or not persuaded. So we measure an individual's moment by moment, second by second opinion, what they're seeing visually, what they're hearing orally, whether they trust what they're hearing. And it allows us to break down every ad, every speech. And over three hours, we get them going. I have people crying in the focus groups. I have people yelling at each other. It's just like real life. All right, take a look. This is the first one we're going to show you. You set this up for me. This is an ad, Obama keeping his word on equal pay. The president will tout his signing of the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which assures equal pay for women. What should we notice about this ad? First off, it's the best Obama ad of the campaign. And it's one of the reasons why he has such a good advantage among women. Obama is going to score, no matter what happens in the election, whoever wins, Obama's going to do far better among women than Mitt Romney does. And this ad is one of those reasons. By the way, the red line that you see, those are swing Republicans. The green line are swing Democrats. The higher that the lines climb, the more favorable, the more persuasive the ad. And this ad is incredible. Roll ad. Here it is. The problem in these cases isn't that the woman is somehow unqualified. They're doing the same job with the same qualifications. 
and they're being paid differently. The problem is employers aren't treating women fairly. That needs to be changed, and I'll change it when I'm president of the United States of America. Signing this bill today is to send a clear message that making our economy work means making sure it works for everybody. So it's registered with both green and red, but Republicans and Democrats. Yes. Democrats and Republicans. And there's so few ads, maybe 1% of all ads actually work with both political parties because we are so divided. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's powerful is you get to hear his voice. You see him speaking, then you see the record. It, it, it's you powerful. See the you see the promise and the performance. Exactly. The next, you asked us to take a look at two, and then we'll talk about others. Americans for Prosperity, New Ideas. In this ad, uh, 2008 Obama voters discuss why they have become disillusioned with his presidency. Roll tape. In 2008, I voted for Barack Obama. He was new. He had new ideas. I think that now we've given Obama a fair chance, and I don't think he's able to do what we need him to do. The president's doing a mediocre job. You know, the economy, in my opinion, is still the same as it was four years ago. Obama said that he was going to help the middle class, and that's where I am. I'm the middle class, and instead it has hurt me. I have not received the hope and change that I believed in in 2008. Americans for Prosperity is responsible for the content of this advertising. So what do we see? It's that last line. I didn't see the hope and change that I voted in, that I voted for. I'm the middle class, and it hasn't helped. What's different about that ad? And we've done it now in two sessions where that's been the best tested ad of all the ones we've tried. It's because it's real people. Those aren't actors. Those are real people. And they embrace why they voted for Obama in 2008. And now they tell you how life has changed for them since then. And this is key, Charlie. If you rip the bark off of your opponent in the first two or three seconds, no one's going to pay attention. If you've got this really deep announcer that right. sounds like the movie Jaws, right. it doesn't connect. If you've got this ominous... you got to draw them in first. You've got to draw them in, and you have to appeal to the public's decency first before you deliver the analysis of why the opponent failed. Uh, you and I have talked before uh, at CBS this morning about this ad about the coffin. Why is that so powerful and effective? And tell me about the ad. It's so powerful because this individual, it's a one minute ad, and it was done by, uh, uh, I think it was Families USA. Right. Which and is a super PAC or? Super PAC. So it's not an Obama ad, it's done on behalf of Obama. And he talks about building a stage with his colleagues that the CEO of the company then comes out on the stage and everyone and closes down the plant. He then says that Mitt Romney made millions and millions of dollars off of buying that plant. And when he built that stage, he felt like he was building his own coffin and it made me sick. That's the end of the ad. And people look at that and they empathize. And you see this groan as someone who's very real talks about what Bain Capital did. It is the single best ad of this campaign, and I'll tell you something. If Barack Obama wins in November, and he wins because of Ohio, it'll be because of that ad. That's how powerful it is. And they got it out early as Mitt Romney was being defined. Correct. And they the Romney a lot of money on that kind of advertising. I mean, some people will argue uh, that Mitt Romney had to spend a lot of his time talking about himself because he'd been defined by these kinds of ads, and therefore did not spend enough time talking about the future. I think he let the, the and I think he let the he let others define what Bain Capital is. That he never defended economic freedom. That he never stood up and say these are this company. Was it because he didn't have the money to do do that, or some other reason? But there could have been independent expenditures, and yes, he had the money. I don't think that they took it seriously. I think they really believed that this would be a referendum on the Obama administration, which is what they want. Which is what they wanted. But you can't get what you want. It's like the Rolling Stones song. You can't always get what you want. And if you try sometimes, you don't always find you get what you need. How powerful is this idea that came up over the weekend of are you better off now than you were four years ago? It's brilliant. And I wonder what took them so long to come up with it. And the answer, and again in our sessions we just did, here's what's interesting. A significant percentage aren't better off than they were four years ago. But if you change the question from you to the country, is America better or worse off, then it's overwhelmingly worse off. 
And so the Romney campaign is onto something, but they're missing the point. It's not just you, me, and the people here. Yeah. It's the country. Nice. And, and Barack Obama is responsible for the country. But you're not the only person in the world who does focus groups. But Romney people must understand this, don't they? I'm the only person who does focus groups where everybody yells at each other. I'm the only person who does focus groups where people go out afterwards for beers. There's, it's, it's a science. It's not just an art. And it's a science of understanding how people react. And if you listen carefully, the key to the best research is listening. Yeah. And maybe they didn't hear it. Or maybe they didn't ask the right questions. But I'll tell you something. It's deep. And the reason why Obama's got the advantage is because they still think that he's trying. Even if they don't think and, he's... And the word they use is cares, too. Uh, no, you're going to argue with cares. You're going to say trying is more important. I'm, because that's what they say to me. And the word that they use to describe his, his uh, administration, disappointed. Not betrayed. Not this really harsh negative. Hmm. He's trying. He hasn't succeeded. Not that he's failed. He hasn't succeeded. And we're disappointed in him. That means that he still has a shot of winning these last undecided voters. In Mitt Romney's case, he's a problem solver. He knows how to get the job done. But I'm not convinced, because he is wealthy, I'm not convinced that he understands me, that he understands those who, who work for a living. Romney can, was supposed Suppose to... Suppose you were, it would dial back to uh, sort of the middle of the Republican primaries, mm -hmm. right? And, and you're trying to, Mitt Romney, both win the primaries, which is a crucial step for you, of which there is no end if you, there's only an end if you don't win, but if you win, you have another step. What would you have done? How would you have tried to define yourself? Absolutely, and I would have gone at my business career, and that's what I would have focused on. Not governor of Massachusetts. One out of five Americans knew back in April or early May about Bain Capital. Only one out of five. He should have known that by the time he reached September, four out of five would know yeah. about Bain. He never explained it. Now, here's the analogy you can make, and I often thought watch the Olympics. And what do people love about the Olympics? They love people who work hard and try and win. And could people who come back and are showered at adulation are the winners, right? So we like winning. How would you define the business story then if it's not a story of an American success story? Okay. The way that I would do this, this is, a, this is the crux of the campaign. So congratulations on this. It's not that I won. It's that you won. Because uh, we were successful. You were successful. We invested in Staples. It became an incredible company. Okay. Yeah. You, it, it's all about you. It's all about them who are watching me right here. Yeah. If it becomes about him, he loses. Because then he's just a rich guy. Yeah. So a, he missed the opportunity to say, it was not my success. It was your success. The men and women who work at Sports Authority or Staples or wherever, you know. Are you going into politics? No. You could be his advisor. <laughs> but that's the point, isn't it? You have to sort of... And it always comes back to how people feel. Do they understand me? Do they care about me? And do they know that I want what's better for my family? There are two great quotes. Number one is, people will forget what you said to them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Who said that? Nelson Mandela. And second... Let me just repeat that. People will forget what you said about them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Right. Second? Second is, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. What do you think of that one? I like it both. That's uh, mine. <laughs> that's yours? Yeah. It's not? It's not? It's not what you say. In this discussion here, right. it'll be what people remember, what people heard from me, rather than what I said. That matters. So it's what you hear. Exactly. Thank you, Frank. Good to see you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.